All right, here we go. We have Keith K.P. Presley, also known as Chicago's Black Scarface. Welcome to Vlad TV. Man, it's a pleasure to be here, man. It's a real treat. Well, you know, a lot of stories have been told about you, but I really want to get the, you know, the real from the person. So I want to start in the very beginning. So you grew up in Chicago. Yes, I did. In uh, the Wild Hundreds. Indeed. Okay, on 103rd, right? Ten Trey. Ten Trey. So what was that like in the, the 70s? The 70s, it was very pleasant. It wasn't a, nothing, no no criminal activity that I knew of because I lived a very square life. Okay. And my parents and I, both my parents together, they both worked. One worked in the steel mill, one worked for CTA, the Chicago Public Transit Union. And uh, I was just an atypical kid in elementary school in the 70s. Okay. And as you're growing up, you go to high school, you go to uh, Percy L. Julian High School. Money Jaguars. Okay. And at that point, are you completely square, not doing anything, just an athlete and going to school? Um, square as a pool table and twice as green. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you graduate high school and you're actually an athlete. You're a wrestler, right? Correct. You go to college. Yes. Uh, Eastern Illinois University. Yes. So what was that like when you first went there? It was a beautiful experience for me because uh, I never inspired to go to college, really. Um, but I ended up getting a, a scholarship for wrestling and uh, went to Eastern and just became an adult there. I went in a kid, came out an adult. Okay. And this is the early 80s, like 82, 83? 82, 82, yes. Okay. So here you are, you're going to college with aspirations to, to do sports and get a degree. Then at one point, you meet someone that kind of changes your trajectory. That's true. Okay. And who was that? Uh, a friend of mine is on the college campus. Uh, he came to my dorm, not my, came to my apartment, and he was like, man, I need to use your place. And uh, long story short, he wanted to chop up some drugs in my place. And that's, was, that's when I became introduced to that. And I'm like, whoa, he can do that. I could do this. And that's where the bug bit me at. Okay. And that was cocaine? Yes, that was cocaine. Okay, so what, he just had, what, like an ounce and he wanted he to just had bag it up? He had an eight ball. Eight ball. A whole eight ball. Okay. Whew, he was balling. Okay. So he breaks it up, bags it up in your house, and then he brings you into the... No, he didn't. He, you know, he went on about his way. He bagged up like $500 worth of stuff. And I'm like, damn, that's $500 worth? That's 500 You know, 500 We're talking about 1986. $500 is like $5,000 right now. So I'm looking at like, wow, he's in the, he's, and he said he, he had it all, all them sold basically. And I'm just looking at like, he ain't no different than me. He can do it. I could do it. Okay. And at that point, have you ever tried drugs? Never, never been. I'm 57 right now. I've never been drunk a high day for in my life. Never tried it. Never knew what a drug dealer was until I became one. Okay. So even in the neighborhood where you were, you didn't see... Drug dealers, drug addicts, nothing else like no, that. No, I grew up very middle class. I mean, it was people that did drugs, of course, but wasn't nobody hanging out on the corner, wasn't nobody nodding out, wasn't nobody shooting each other. Uh, and then I was an athlete, I was a star athlete, so I stayed in, in that realm. I hung with people that was trying to lift weights and run and, you know, try to get scholarships and stuff like that. So I never hung in the streets, never, you know, gang bang and none of that kind of stuff. Okay, but now you got introduced to this fast money. And do you go and buy some yourself at that point? Exactly. So uh, I initially went, uh, the guy who introduced me to the game, he turned me on to his connect and I went and caught me an eight ball. Okay. So now you have an eight ball. Right. And so you it, customers. Yeah. So the, the funny part about it is when I went to go buy, buy the drugs, uh, he gave it to me in an eight ball. So I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this? I ain't got no bags. I ain't got no nothing. Like, so he told me he charged me another twenty five dollars to bag it up and mix it up for me. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just, I, that's how green I was, man. I didn't know nothing. I just all I knew I was going to double my money. That's all I knew. Okay. And how'd you get your customers initially? Um, I talk about that in my book where I was just on the block and one of the guys said he finna go get some cocaine. I'm like, I got some, and they thought I was joking because. I'm not known to be a street dude and I'm a comedian in the hood. So they look at me like, yeah, right. I'm like, man, I, I got some. So I ran to the house and brought all of my, was it 20 bags? I brought all 20 bags out. Like, look. <laughs> <laughs> so he 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 bought one and he, he took a bump, 
because uh, he was they wasn't freebasing then. He was he was just a snorter. He took a bummer like man, this some good shit. And uh, he bought another bag, and then I left there and went to shoot some dice with some cats. And lo and behold, these guys was in the back room freebasing. And the rest of history, man. I made five hundred dollars in one day, and uh, that the greed set in instantly. Like five hundred in one day, it was effortless. Right, and the next forty-five days, you made around forty thousand. In forty-five days, I made thirty thousand dollars. Thirty thousand. Yes. Okay. And for being a college student, you're basically rich at that point. I uh, I went from having a couple of hundred dollars to having thirty thousand dollars at my disposal in forty-five days. Okay. So you essentially, and you talked about this in in your article on As Is, you went from being a college student selling drugs to a drug dealer that was in college. Yes, that's true. Because even though, matter of fact, when I first started in 1986. Up to an eight ball was a misdemeanor for cocaine. Mm. So you got guys doing 30 year sentences now for eight balls when they changed the law in 87 uh, when it's cracked. So it's 100 to one. So if you had some prior convictions and stuff. So I went for, it went from being a misdemeanor to like getting real major time. So I understood that I wasn't a small time because when I first got in the game, I bought an eight ball. And then in uh, you know 45 days, I'm buying a quarter key. So okay. and I was in college. Okay, and by the time you're graduating, you're pulling up in a Benz with AMG rims and you're you're wearing mink coats and you're just doing the most. Yeah, I was doing the most this. That's what I was doing. I mean, that's what you do. It's new money. You want everybody to know you got it. So when I graduated from college, uh, I went to my college graduation in my own AMG Benz with a mink coat. The car was completely paid for. Uh, you couldn't tell me nothing. You couldn't hit me in the ass with a red apple, even though my AMG Benz was red. Mm. You know, I was 22 and I had a 29-year-old girlfriend and I was living a good life, you know. That's, that's that's the truth. Okay, so now you graduate and now you're a full-time drug dealer. Absolutely. Never went to pick up my diploma or nothing. I'm, I'm all in. All in. When do you get the bigger plug? That came years later. Um... Uh, I never inspired to be a kingpin or nothing like that. It grew organically. It's just, it was, if you think about it, when I finished college, I had at least $100,000 cash. So I'm rich. I didn't have no aspiration to be no million. I'm already rich. I got the car I want. I live downtown Chicago. I got mink coats. I got Maury shoes. I got Barber Bates leather outfits. I got North B leather outfits. Uh, I'm, I'm rich, even though I know it's guys over much larger than me. I found out later there's levels to it, but in my mind, I was content. Okay. And a couple of years later, you actually get a bigger plug. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be what I became. I was just, you know, that's a lot of money still to have. Uh, where I'm living, the cars I'm driving, the women I'm dating, the clothes I'm wearing. It was, to me, to me, I was, I was, I was the man. I was the shit, but I wasn't. I was just, I was in the way, really. <laughs> Okay, and then your plug actually came from the Mexican cartel. That's true. How did that plug come together? Uh, I talk about that in my book where uh, a guy who I was dealing with, he um, he ended up getting murdered, and I ended up inheriting it uh, through a, a bunch of layers of things, you know what I'm saying? Just it happened, and uh, I go into great detail about it uh, where uh, initially, I think, I want to say initially that I got 50 keys from them or something like that. Initially, that's like right off the top. They gave me 50 keys, in front of me 50 keys. And uh, I want to make sure I tell the story correct. No, uh, the first time I seen them, I think I got 200 keys. It was either 50 or 200. I can't remember right off the top of my head right now. It was a substantial amount of drugs. That's for sure. Well, how much were keys going for it back then? In Chicago, like 17,000. Okay. So 200 keys times 17,000, to about $3.4 million. Yeah. Someone just gave you $3.4 million and said, we really hope that you bring this money back or else. That's what happened, yes. Because if you don't bring it back, there's going to be massive repercussions. Oh, uh, you're going to have to answer. Right. You and everyone you know. That's for sure. Okay. So now you're sitting on 200 kilos. How do you get rid of that much weight? Because you've never seen that much weight before. 
Well, at the time, I was moving 50 keys a week. So it's a natural progression to go to 200. You just, I end up going back to every guy I ever dealt with before and uh, negotiating with him. Negotiated a deal, came to terms, and I became their plug. Okay. With this game comes the jealousy, comes the kidnappings, comes the robberies, comes the snitching, comes the violence, and you had to deal with all that. Mm -hmm. There was actually a, a kidnapping that happened with one of your guys. That's true. Talk about that. Oh my God, this dude, <laughs> he's so blessed to have me in his life because literally if he would have called me 10 minutes later, he probably would have been dead. I was on my way out of town and uh, he called me and, you know, basically talking about bring $400,000 down to these guys. Um, and I was like, for what? And he's like, I'm kidnapped. And uh, you know what happened to kidnaps, man? They, they was putting the bats on them. They was, they was treating them real bad. And uh, long story short, short story short, I ended up paying this ransom. I ended up giving them um, like $75,000, $85,000. And uh, they let them go. Now, if I wouldn't have took that money down there, those guys who had them, they was real killers. They would have took them out. He know it, I know it, and everybody that know know about the story know he would have been offed. Okay, what happened to those guys, ultimately? Oh, man, uh, dude, uh, the guys who kidnapped them? Yeah. I think they got, they got away. They got away. I, I think, I'm not sure, because that was his problem. That wasn't my problem. That was his problem to, to solve. I just saved his life. That's all I did. Okay, and there was an attempted kidnapping on you as well. Yes, well, you know, the kidnapping come with the game. Gunplay, kidnapping, jealousy, and all the things you just named. So uh, I peeped game with binoculars, saw them coming, and uh, spent up off them people like New Edition, and they couldn't catch me. They actually chased you? Yes, they chased me. Uh, okay. And I end up uh, running in a hospital, ducking behind some stuff, and by the grace of God, I got away. I mean, was that the most serious situation you had gotten into? No, I've been shot up before. So you actually got hit? Yes. Okay, what was that situation about? Uh, Well, they didn't shoot me for fun. They shot me because they were trying to take me out. And, you know, I got six holes in my body because of that. And uh, I made it. Uh, I'm a winner. I'm a survivor. I'm here. Well, what was the... Can you put me in that situation? Like, what exactly happened? Um, I, I pulled up to my mom's house. A guy speak to me. Next day I know... Them guns going off, and uh, then they sp then they spent off. They spent, you know, they took off, and um, I end up going to the hospital. Been in the hospital for a couple, of, no, about a week or two, and uh, had to rehab and uh, had to wear a colostomy bag and all that old stuff. Damn, mm -hmm. that was a shitty deal. Yeah, literally. Sorry, did you recover from that though? Yes, I'm I'm back. Okay. So this happened right in front of your mother's house? Yes, it did. Was your mother in the house? She was. So she saw you get shot? She did not see me get shot. But she heard you get shot? She heard me get shot. Mm -hmm. So your mother's probably screaming and freaking out and... Uh, well, when I, the, when I, when she opened the door, she thought I was playing because you got to realize I'm a real comedian, man. So she thought I was popping five when, when I bring in the doorbell. She's like, oh, I hear you popping the firecrackers. I'm like, no, nah, mom, I've been shot. And uh, she didn't believe me till I laid on the floor. You know, and I thought I was out of here. Okay. The guys who tried to kill you, you knew who they were? I do not. To this day, I don't know who shot me. Really? I've heard rumors of where it's supposed to came from, but I can't confirm it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the streets talk, but, you know, ain't nobody claiming nothing. I yeah. mean, because well, they, since if they claim it, if they claim it, trust me, they got problems. Okay. And along the way, your friends are getting killed as well. I've had several uh, people, associate friends and family members that end up getting uh, murdered in the game. It come with the game. I mean, when you guys shot yourself, was there a serious, you know, thought process of, I may need to just get out of this. Let me just move somewhere away from here because clearly this is happening in my home city. People know who I am. You know what I'm saying? Like people I know are getting kidnapped. I, You know, there's a kidnapping against me. Like, why not just take the money and just go to California or go out of the country? All that sounds nice, but that ain't real. Because when you're getting real money and grand theft money, you want some more money. So they got guns, I got guns. I got caught off my square. Anybody can get caught off their square. 
You know, they didn't succeed and, and the show must go on. Big wheels keep turning. Okay. And there was a an interesting deal you had, I think, in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Where it was a million dollar drug deal. That's true. Tell me about the guy who actually pulled up to collect the money. I mean, it'll never be another situation to, to, to top that one, man. This man rolls up to me to buy 50 keys of cocaine with a million dollars cash and a 600 bands with rims on it. Hmm. I I couldn't believe it. I mean, did it say drug dealer on the license plate also? Or I think I think he, I think he had a flash uh, a, a cape on too to say, uh, "Look what I do <laughs> for real, man." So anyway, uh, the deal went through. It was it was incredible. I couldn't believe it. He 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 paid for the he paid for the drugs. He put the fifty keys in his trunk and he drove off into the sunset. Right. This was in the hood where you guys are doing the deal. This was in the hood. It's, it was unbelievable. He made it. He a good guy. Man, kudos to you, my man. You're a good guy. Much respect. Uh, okay. So at the height of your operation, you're making $25 million a year? That's what the fled, that's what the feds claimed that I was making. You know, I know I made at least $26 million. Okay. And you had private jets? I rode private jets. I didn't own You didn't own any private uh-uh. jets. Okay. That's before people really know about them PJs. You know, I was ahead of my time. Okay. But with your plug being in Mexico, are you actually going out there meeting with them or they just bring oh, it all I definitely over went out there to meet with them. Definitely sat down with the heads of cartels, worked out worked out the deal, got it back, sold it, gave them their money and, and kept, the, kept the boat afloat. I mean, when people watch Narcos and they see how the Mexican cartels operate and so forth and all the murder and everything else that occurs, how accurate is that from your point of view? I never got into the, the murder part of it. I just I could just speak from my uh my own reality. Uh to me, I was a narco, I was a kingpin and I kept the violence to a minimum, you know. Uh I wasn't no pushover, but you know, I definitely know how to take care of some business. And so because you can't beef and get money, beef and bring heat. And so, you know, I dealt with people that wanted to get money. And, you know, it's, it's and even when you, people that get money, you know, gunplay is, is 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 inevitable. It's going to happen. Well, I mean, what happens along the way, you know, when you get a package and then things happen, the police bust, you know, you know, and, and confiscate a bunch of your product or someone rips you off or, you know, someone you set, you know, who you fronted ends up, you know, losing it or or whatever else. I mean, things go wrong in this game all the time. It's not like you can call the police and report stolen property. You know, and the cartel guys want their money. It doesn't really matter to them what happened to you, right? Yeah, I mean, I agree. That's a great, uh, you have great insight. That's how it goes. So you you pay the bill. Uh, I have a story in my book where, you know, I paid a $2 million bill for somebody. $2 million bill? American money. Okay, because they lost the shipment? Is Yeah, a whole lot got lost. I just know I, I took the responsibility, but it wasn't nothing. I paid $2 million, I made $50 million. Hmm. So that was a good trade-off, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, at the height, how much cash did you have? At I your mean, very height. I get that question asked all the time, and I don't want to just do too much, but okay. I just say that I very easily was an eight-figure guy. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Because nine-figure, you had to be in the 100 million category. So I, I passed, I surpassed 10 million easily, and I was less than 100 million. What was the most ostentatious thing that you ever bought? Just the most over-the-top item, period. I bought a two hundred fifty thousand dollar watch. Really? What kind of watch was that? It was a show par. Okay. Yeah. Top show par. It was a beast. Okay. Yeah. So I had one of my friends. I told him I paid two hundred fifty thousand dollars for the watch, and he told me that before he paid two hundred fifty thousand dollars for a watch, he'll hire somebody to walk behind him and yell out the time. Here you are, and you're running your business, and at one point, uh. Cook County actually puts together a narcotics task uh, strike force, mm-hmm. and they start to investigate your operation. Were you aware that this was happening? Uh, I didn't know it was a narcotic strike force. I didn't know they partic- particular name, but I knew something was happening when uh, all these guys I was serving kept getting popped off like good reefer. Hmm. You know, one guy got popped off with 65 keys. Another guy got popped off with 35 keys. Another person got caught with 30 keys. And, you know, all those things I was responsible for. So just like you said, they lost it. I had to pay for it. I paid for it. Okay. And up to this point, were you getting arrested at all or no? 
I got arrested like later on afterwards because they had me on the tw under 24 uh, hour surveillance and uh, they end up catching me with a pistol and like 20 some thousand dollars in my pocket and, you know, tried to make it a big deal. Okay. Well, the people around you are getting busted and then they really start to get closer to you. And at one point, they actually, you know, pull the trigger and start to bust everybody. Um, this huge seizure comes around. So they're saying the seizure of narcotics was more than $18 million, okay, along with the drugs. So they got 150 kilos of cocaine and other drugs, $882,000 in cash, 11 vehicles, a 26-foot boat, 21 cell phones, five computers, two scales, two money counters, and a custom-made press that was used for packaging narcotics. Does that sound accurate? Yeah, that's accurate. And just that's just what they found. They got lucky. <laughs> and I got lucky too, because they definitely didn't find everything. I mean, I'm just I gotta give credit what credit do, man. Organized crime unit in Chicago, they did a thorough job of what they, you know, putting they putting their team together and surveillance and all that. Uh they really had real evidence and drugs and guns and all that stuff and that Fed case I got, man, that was some duct tape stuff, man. The Fed, Fed case, dealing with the Feds and dealing with the states is night and day. Well, along with what I just mentioned, you know, according to the reports, they said that uh, the drug ring received cocaine and other drugs from Mexico, diluted the narcotics before selling the product to gangs and other street dealers for resale in Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Mm -hmm. So basically, you were pushing this stuff up to like four different states. Yeah, I, I uh, not you personally, but your guys. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, uh, me personally too. I mean, I uh, I took my show on the road. I mean, I got too big for Chicago. Like I just this, it was opportunities was presented, and uh, I wasn't scared to take you know take it to where they wanted to go. They was you know buying large amounts of drugs, so I, the the reward was worth the risk at that time. Right, because they also raided a bunch of homes. Uh, there was a home on twelve hundred block on 168th Street, uh, which I guess was the packaging center for the drugs, and a Chicago home on the 10,000 block of South May Street, which I guess was the distribution center. They also confiscated a home in Olympia Fields worth 175,000, another home in Houston for half a million, and all those homes belong to you. They did. Okay. How many homes did you have at your height? Uh, I had a lot of properties because I was in the real estate business, so I... It, to give a real number, I'd be lying because okay. we because it's fractional sharing and all that stuff. I, I own at one point probably over twenty buildings. Okay, you got indicted on a drug conspiracy uh, and other charges along with a few other people: Christopher uh, Trammell, Amzik Terry, Alex Duncan, Kenneth Dunlap, Holly Baskin Spears, and brothers Preston and Randall Patterson. Mm -hmm. These are all people you knew. I knew most of them. Some of the people that I didn't know because it was people that I was serving, they were serving, so I didn't know them. But, um, I mean, I, 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 everybody you just named, everybody on that case stood up. So no one cooperated? Nobody cooperated. Really? Nobody. Okay, why do you think that is? Uh, I picked a stand-up crew. I got lucky. Blessed. Nobody told. Okay. So this whole crew gets busted. Nobody tells. What ultimately happens to all these people I just mentioned? Everybody got convicted. Everybody, well, I take that back. So, out of everybody on there, one person beat their case uh, in the state, and then the feds came back and, and superseded my indictment in the fed case to bring them up to lock them up uh, for some fair stuff. But everybody uh, lost their case or took a cop except one person, and uh, they end up, you know, they got mad and jealous. Oh, you you think you're doing something? Okay, we're gonna put you in this superseding indictment in the fed case, and uh, end up getting time. Okay, and what what amount of time were they getting, like, on average? Uh, I think the one guy that got caught with, the, like, 65 keys, he got 17 years of, and the, the guy with the 30 keys, he ended up catching a Fed case at the same time. It didn't have to do with my Fed case. So they ran the cases concurrent, and he ended up getting 10 years and the person that got caught with the 35, 30 or 35 keys, they beat the case initially, and then the feds indicted them. They ended up getting like about three years because they had already got the big fish, me. Mm -hmm. So they, they gave them like a minor role and gave them all those uh, deductions for being first-time offender, family, and all that other stuff. 
Okay, and you were given a million dollar bond? Yes. You paid it? No, I, I went on the lamb. I went on the lamb. I really? Jumped, I jumped the million dollar bond. Aha. Yeah, so Illinois bonds works different than everywhere else. We the only place that you pay 10% and then you get all your money back except 10%. So if you got a million dollar bond, you pay 100,000, mm -hmm. you get 99, whatever, 10%, 90,000 back. So like if you get a million dollar bond here, you got to get somebody a bills bondsman to pay a uh, 100,000, then they, the bills been keep the $100,000. Mm -hmm. It don't work like that in Chicago. So, you know, I'm the gingerbread man, catch me if you can. I was going to win. Okay, so you jump on. Hello. And then where'd you go? Man, I was out and about like a Girl Scout on a new route trying to figure it out without a doubt. <laughs> Man, being on the run ain't no fun. Trust me. I bet. Please believe that. I was everywhere. Okay. And you... I was close too at the same time. I can't tell you that because I might have to go on the run again. No, I'm just okay. joking, man. I mean, were you no, out of the country? No, no, for real. No, I never went out. The, I never made it out the country. Why? Because you just couldn't. I couldn't just do felt it? like I just felt like I was going to beat the case, man. When you got a lot of money, you just cocky, man, for no reason. You don't understand. It's one you, and then there's a whole team of people against you. Well, I mean, when you talk about federal cases, it's the United States of America versus. But I wasn't. It wasn't. I, I didn't have a federal case. You had at a first. state case. At I that had point. a state case at first, so that's that's what made me have even more confidence. Okay. But the state case, you're facing 60 to life. Yes, I was. And you're, what, 30-something at the time? 34. 34. So you're basically twice <laughs> your life at that point behind bars. They finally catch you? Yes, I finally end up getting caught. Uh, how did they catch you? Uh, Traffic stop. Uh, that's that's what they claim. But I believe somebody gave me up. I can't prove it, though. Uh, I was uh out of, in another state. Picking up some bread just to be on the run. It costs money to be on the run. For all you guys that want to be on the run, man, can't be on the run broke. It ain't going to happen. It's a beautiful thing to be rich. I can attest to that. So <laughs> I had plenty of money and I uh, went to go give me some money so I can, you know, continue to enjoy my life. And you got to realize it wasn't all the technology they have today with all this voice recognition, uh, cameras everywhere, facial recognition. It was it was kind of easy to move around. They didn't have digital license, uh, driver's license back then. And, it was it was it was easy to move around. Okay, so you finally get caught. They extradite you back to Chicago. Mm -hmm. And then you end up catching a Fed case as well. Exactly. So I get back, um, fighting the uh, the state case for about a year and a half in the county jail, and uh, uh, I'm in the hole at this time because I had to whoop a dude. I gave him some act rights, and I told you so. And uh, they put me in the hole. <laughs> and then the, the marshals come and they was like, uh, uh, pack your bags. So I'm thinking that the case actually got picked up by the feds. I'm thinking this is, you know, the same case being picked up. I called my attorney and uh, long story short, he was like, no, this is a new case out of the uh, uh, Eastern District because Illinois is called the Northern District. OK, so now you have a state case and a federal case at the same time. Pressure. So the Fed case comes first. Well, uh, we strategically, me and my team of attorneys uh, came up with the plan to fight the Fed case first because big time is supposed to eat up little time. Mm -hmm. So we figured if we lost there, then we can get the uh, the state case to be ran concurrent with it. Okay, how much are you facing on the Fed case? Thirty to life. Thirty to life. I was level forty-two. Uh, level it was thirty to life. That's the least amount of time I can get, not yeah. unless I take a cop. The cop was twenty-five years. And uh, the only way you can get less than 30 years uh, at level 42 if you cooperate. Okay. They asked you if you want to cooperate? Absolutely. And you told them? I told them to go play with a bomb. <laughs> Could you have walked away by cooperating? No, they offered me nine years to cooperate. They wanted me to take them to Colombia, Mexico, California, Atlanta, and maybe one other place. But... They want to go on a world tour with you. Yeah, they want to they want to break a real cat down, man. But I, I ain't no tent, so I don't fold. I mean, I can't even imagine going to Colombia <laughs> to try to set someone up for a, a Fed case. I can't I mean, imagine it. Imagine the danger level just overall of doing that. Well, you know, the guys don't think I mean, about it. Lock the, me up. I'm good. The, the, <laughs> I'm not doing that. Guys don't think like that no more. I'm from the old school, man. I'm the last of the dying breed, man. They don't cut them like this no more. Yeah. Yeah, I bet. Okay, so you have the Fed case. You're facing 30 to life. And the, the two life is a dangerous part of the equation because you can get five to life and end up doing the rest of your life in prison. 
they could just keep denying you every year. I mean, well, they, it they, they don't do the parole system in the feds. You do 80, 85% of your time, but life is life in the feds. There is no parole. When you get life, you stuck there. You go home in a wooden box. That's how that go. That's how that story ends. Okay, so you're facing 30 life and you actually start the trial. Mm -hmm. How much money did you spend in that case with all the lawyers and everything? I had a team of three attorneys and I spent, I don't want to exaggerate, because they end up paying for everybody else's lawyers too. I spent over half a million dollars in, 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 in attorney fees. Okay, and with that half a million you spent, you actually ended up being found guilty. Yes. It was a jury verdict? Yes, I went to trial. Okay. When you heard guilty at 34, 35 years old, how'd you feel? Oh, I don't even know how I feel. I think the wind was knocked out of me, but it was, you know, pretty much expected because when people bought 150 some keys and then $3 million cash and there's a black guy with a $2,000 suit on, I'm guilty. Jesus Christ, it's Jesus Christ going to be hard to beat that one. I mean, what was the defense? How did you try to get out of it? Well, I never got caught with anything. Everybody else got caught. And then all the drugs that they bought in the federal case is from the state case. So how you going to prove I can, they ain't got me on tape giving nobody nothing. They don't have me on tape making no drug deals or nothing. Well, so how do they convict you? If everyone, if all the, your co-defendants are not cooperating, they, they haven't caught you with anything. So, hold on, let me back up. My co-defendants in my state case did not cooperate. The Fed case, they put me on with a bunch of cats. I, only, I ain't even know these cats. But the main guy I was serving, he cooperated. Mm -hmm. He went down there and went platinum. He went double platinum. <laughs> Luther Vandross, double platinum. <laughs> He's working on diamond status. The man is a cold rat in a B-I-T-C-H, all caps. And he cooperated completely against oh, you. Oh, my God. Took the man. stand and everything? Did he take the stand? He did the you y out? He did the Watusi. He took the stand. <laughs> Uh, he was cold. He was a cold-blooded man. The man pointed me out, and I ain't do nothing but make the man a millionaire. And he he returned the favor by saying, "Hey, I got caught talking on the phone about drugs. I got caught with all this money. I got caught with drugs. I got set up by my own cousin. So let me just let me just do something to the guy that did the most for me. Mm. Hey, he pointed me out. Uh, he ended up he ended up getting like five years. And then when he took the stand. He's trying to give me life because the case carried 30 to life. The feds told me if I go to trial, they're going to give me life because of all the stuff that's attached to me. And they, they, this, and you asked, how could you get convicted? I told you the state and the feds is different. At the time I went to trial, uh, they use a lot of relevant conduct. You know, people can just come in there and say, oh, I bought, because this dude say he bought, I sold him 60 keys. That's just the most arbitrary number in the world. They made him say that because Anything over 50 keys is, you know, this 30 to life category. So he put me at the 60. Mm -hmm. So so uh, 50 to 150 keys is the same amount. You get the same time. And then 150 keys to infinity is the same amount of time. So, you know, it's, it's a strategic thing, man. Uh, I ain't mad at the cat, man. You know, he, he got to live with the label of a rat. And I got to live with the label of a boss and a stand-up guy. Okay so, you end up, uh, okay, so you end up blowing trial in your Fed case. And they gave you 30 years for that? They gave me 360 months, which is 30 years. The yeah. feds don't, don't, they don't sentence you in years. They sentence you in months. Okay. So now you're looking at 30 years in the feds. And then there's a state case. That is correct. And you got 12 years. Yes. So what I ended up doing was I was, I was sitting in the county jail. I've been locked up at this point like five years. I'm sitting in the county. County jail is the worst time. I mean, it's, it's terrible, oh, especially Cook, Cook County. Cook County? Woo. All county jails is bad, but Cook County is a whole nother ball game. We, we just had a couple of guys from Chicago, yeah. Rico Reckless and uh, Ewald Sam will talk about what I goes saw on. It. I you know what I'm talking it. about? Yes. Uh, the Cook County jail. Yeah. It's the, real. That's the, that's why I told you I gave the dude the act rights and I told you so. You know what I'm saying? The most <laughs> horrific shit I ever heard, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, what Glock Dookie's in that bitch? Motherfucker, pull up on your ass with a Glock Dookie, rob okay, you. Dookie Glock seven. Dookie in front of Gray's toothpaste. That bitch got shit in it, piss in it, nut in it, shaving cream, all type of shit. Motherfucker, go. Motherfucker, walk up on your ass with that bitch. What move right now? Spray the bitch in your face. You, you don't want this shit. Don't you? You, you getting robbed? Wait, 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 wait. You telling me they, they make guns? Glock Dookie's. AK Dookie Seven. Glock Dookie with a switch on that bitch. Nigga, they motherfucker put shit, piss, nut. That actually happens in these jails. Look, Cook County ain't no joke. You got to realize. 
Chicago is a gang cultured city. So everybody in there is gang affiliated. So you got all these oppositions in different neighborhoods and stuff where you can't you can't go and hide. You can't shoot the California. You right you go in California, you, the, the street is called California, you right there. So it was a lot of foolishness and chicanery that t- transpired, you know, in there. And it's a lot it's a lot of, you know, it's when I was in jail, they had a lot more organization. I don't know what it is now, you know, it's a you know, it's just the biggest fool, I guess. So that's how that game go. Okay, so you get 12 years in your state case. Mm-hmm. And then it's supposed to run concurrent, but they're trying to tag it on to the 30 years. So let me break that down for you. I end up taking a cop for 12 years. The case carries 60 to life. Uh, and the reason why I took the cop, honestly, is so I can go to the state penitentiary. Because I want to go to the state penitentiary, because guess why? why you get that? your own television in state penitentiary. Mm. And I made a promise to myself that I would never get into a fight over television because a lot of people get their head bust open about a television because, you know, they poly, uh, jailhouse politics. So I was able to get my own television that I can turn my own channel. Woo, woo, woo. So I took the cuss so I can go do state time because in fair time, you can't get your television either. You got to go to the day room. Mm. So that's the reason why I took it. I was wore out. I already had 30 years. So I took the cop for 12 years, which is on the record that the judge said run concurrent with the 30. Right? And he asked me, what do you want to go? I said, he said, you want to do state time or fair time first? I said, send me to the state for the television. That's where I wanted to go. And um, when I did my state time, uh, they transferred me to the fair joint. And when I get there, they said, guess what? Ain't none of the time you did in the state going to count. Mm. So my out date was 2035. Damn. 42 years. Yes. My out date was 2035. And it was 2031 with good time. That means I got to go... 30, 20 some years without whooping a, a joke of A, you know, getting into some fisticuffs. Okay. So you started doing your time. During the course of doing this time, what do you think was the most craziest thing you had to go through? The craziest thing is just watching guys you thought was built a certain kind of way, man. Really not really not that guy they 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 facades man they, that's that was the, the the strangest thing for me just watching cats man just unravel and fold and just can't stand pressure that that was that to me you know everybody jail experience is different you know my intellect and understanding that i read the contract before i signed it so jail was it was in the contract that i can go to jail so it didn't bother me like that uh watching people feel more hurt that I'm doing time than I was feeling myself. Like when my parents came, my sister, my sibling, my girlfriends, when they came to see me, they was hurting worse than me. I was okay. I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't okay to be in jail, but jail didn't break me down because it's mental. And mentally I was, I'm one of the strongest guys on this planet and thought is the cause of it all. Well, ultimately you had 30 plus 12. You were able to, make the 30 and the 12 go, run concurrent, right? Uh, yes and no. So what happened was how I was able to, uh, when my appeal was, I was on direct appeal and I had favor on me because when I was locked up in the state case, I kept asking for uh, extensions for my direct appeal because I was telling them that I'm doing this date time and, you know, I need to go through all these discovery and all that. And during that time, I kept getting all those extensions. Uh, a case law came out called Booker and Blakely. And when I, on my direct appeal, I was able to get back on Booker Blakely, which stated that the, the, the guidelines that they had in place, which was mandatory guidelines, which said I carry 30 to life, said they was unconstitutional. So when Booker Blakely was uh, put in play, it's, it changed it from being uh, mandatory to advisory. Mm. So when I went back in front of the judge, I had all these mitigating factors, and uh, he agreed with my argument and reduced my sentence from 30 years to uh, 10 years. Got it. How did that feel? Oh, my God. That, that was the best feeling in the world. It was euphoria. It was utopia. It was nirvana. All of that. It, it really was. I really literally didn't hit the... Uh, my, I walked on clouds for about two or three weeks. 
Okay. And when he lowered it to 10, how many years were you in at that point? I was in seven years. So when he lowered to 10, I still had, um, according to them, because I went into the federal penitentiary system in 2005 and they resentenced me in 2007. To them, I still had additional like six and a half years to do because they still hadn't credited me the time I did in the state. So I had got sentenced to 12 years, but you, in, the, in the state of Illinois, you do half your time and you get six months good time. So I did five and a half years on that on that bit. So when I when they lowered my, they took me out the FCI and sent me to a camp and uh, I still was fighting to get the time uh, credited. Eventually I won that through a, what they call a thing called administrative remedy where uh, they agreed with my argument that the time should be credited because the drugs and the case and the timeline was all the same. And it was on the record that the judge wanted my case ran concurrent. Well, ultimately, you went from potentially 42 years to doing eight years and getting out in 2007. Yes. I mean, it wasn't potential. Yeah. 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 I was sentenced to 42 years yeah. and the time was real and I would have had to do it mm-hmm. if I didn't win my appeal. Because the, the feds, they, they, they stand you on giving time back. They yeah. really stand you, man. So I put myself in a very unique category when I, when I did the unthinkable. Uh, here's a guy that had millions of dollars and hundreds of keys sitting on a table that's got a, a sentence of somebody that's affiliated with somebody like me. But, you know, I never got caught with none of those drugs and it was, uh, you know, you got to follow the law. You can't break the law to enforce the law. That's called fruit of the poison tree. So um, I call it a blessing and thank God. I mean, how did it feel to walk out in 2007? Uh, it was a beautiful thing, man. A lot of people thought they saw a ghost because they thought they thought the story was over for me when I got those 42 years. People would just disappeared on me, started treating me real bad and playing me like I was playing me like I was a stool pigeon. And the cold part about it is, you know, the guys that tell, they come back home, they get celebrated. Here, I am a stand-up guy. Ain't nobody went to jail behind what Keith Presley said. Ain't nobody can say that I pointed them out or I went behind some tenant windows and gave some secret uh, debriefing or, or what's the other thing called? I uh, uh, can't even think of the name of it where you... You get some, you tell, you, you basically go tell everything, a proffer. Proffer agreement. Yeah. I, Queen for a day. Yeah, there you go. So <laughs> nobody got any proffers. Nobody got no debriefers. Nobody got no statements. Nobody got nothing. I'm stand up 100%, no clouds over my head. And I'm proud of that. Well, one thing that I've always heard with guys who are in a position like yours that go in for a long period of time they put property in other people's names. They have people hold money for them and, and so forth. And then when they get out, the money spent. And there's usually a good reason from the person why they spent it because they needed it more than you. The property is in someone else's name and they don't want to give it back. And all this stuff that they're thinking they're going to have waiting for them is usually not there. Let the church say amen. That is the gospel truth, man. That's why I named my book, It's a Dirty Game. It's dirty, man. This game is dirty. Uh, from people that you think you can trust, family, friends, associates, business people, co- uh, corporate people. I've had, I, mean, I had people from some of the biggest corporations in the world scam me, man, because once the shit hit the fan, because, you know, I had to do everything like under the rug, under the, behind it. So that's why, you know, I'm pushing this legal thing so bad. I'm pushing it tough because you can, you can live the same lifestyle without having to go through all that. You can take care of your own affairs. You don't have to trust nobody to take care of your affairs. You put your affairs in order, you take care of your business, and you ain't got to worry about going to jail. I mean, if you were to guess how much people stole from you by the time you got out, how much would that be? It's in the millions because I told you all those properties I had, my accountant ended up stealing them. Wow. He ended up going to the DEA on me. Wow. Mm -hmm. Your own accountant. My own accountant. But you got to read the book to find out what happened to him. (laughs) Okay. I mean, did you ever run it? Aside from your account, did you ever run into the people that stole from you like that? Uh, I'll tell you a funny story. A dude I used to front a million dollars worth of drugs to. When I was locked up, my sister said she saw him at the front row of a concert. He didn't even ask about me. That's cold-blooded, man. Mm. Not only not only did you not, I didn't tell on you, which I never tell on nobody. Uh, 
you don't have enough respect to say, man, how your brother doing? He go two or three hundred for him. Even though I ain't no two or three hundred dollar guy, you should have dropped some thousand. I'm giving you a million dollars worth of drugs. Mm. You don't pay me. You owe me. Uh, I'm a stand up guy. Like, what what can a person ask for, man? Yeah, I mean, the other thing that I hear from people that go in, like for example, Freeway Ricky Ross. Mm -hmm. He said that when he first got life in prison and his own plug ended up testifying against him, he got angry. He felt it was unfair. This is a guy that he helped make millions of dollars to, who he was close to, and they knew each other's families. And how could this guy turn against him? And it was just, you know, he really felt like a victim until he took some time to realize that going into the drug game, you will get told on. Mm -hmm. it's it's not a maybe it'll happen it's it's going to happen and once he accepted in his mind that hey getting snitched on is part of the drug game so i can't be mad at the people who snitched on me because this is what i signed up for and at that point he took you know the law into his own hands and he managed to find a loophole to get him out yes did you come to the same conclusion when you were in prison me and rick have a similar story from the standpoint that how i caught that organized crime unit case the cartel one of these workers got caught with like 700 bricks and 5 million cash or, or the vice versa. Damn. It was, vice, it was vice versa and they cooperated and that's how they started my investigation. So yeah, the guy didn't tell me directly, but he told on, he told on how he was, he was a worker. So mm -hmm. he flipped. Uh, and so for me, my story a little bit different. Yeah, I was bitter. I was bitter uh, at the guy that told on me. I, I have to admit that. And it, it's, it's very similar, but just a little bit different. Uh, I I never accepted that all that time. Like, I just knew that my life wasn't meant for me to be doing 42 years in jail for two other people that got caught up. I never, at that point, I never been caught with nothing except a pistol. Okay, so you get out in 2007. And at that point, you're completely done with the drug game. Yes. Was it tempting? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, so this is the God and his truth. When I got out, God is my witness. A guy came to me talking about he got 300 on the way. 300 kilos? Yes. Okay. I laughed at him because to me that wasn't enough. <laughs> Not knowing that the trajectory of uh, the trajectory of the game had changed immensely. You know, it's like when I went to went to jail, you know, uh kids was fifteen thousand, whatever, and now they was like thirty, thirty five thousand and mm -hmm. it you know, you had a bunch of guys that was fifty key guys, hundred key guys, you know, you had a bunch of that that all those days is going up and dry. So I laughed and then when I seen how serious it was, I'm like, Whoa, man, that was a blessing, but that guy, he uh he ended up disappearing, man. So that's it, that's crazy. I mean, I wasn't home a week. And he showed up, but uh, even even when I was locked up, the uh, the cartel they came to see me. You know, they had their ways of coming to see me just to make sure I was doing what, the right thing, and what, and they saw that I was doing the right thing. So, you know, they they understood that uh, I'm stand up, man. That just that's the only why. I, I, nobody wants to do 42 years. Nobody want to do life. Nobody want to do 10 years. But if you you plan the game, you gotta you know you gotta be a man and set what come with the game. Well, you end up writing a book about your experiences. Yes, I did. And what's unique about the book is you're actually selling the book for $1,000. Yes, $1,000 American money. Right. And how many have you sold so far? I have sold, as of today, 201 books, and I haven't even released the book yet. I'm going to do an official release April 15th. That's going to be my official release date. So I've pre-sold 201 books, and I'm pretty sure before April 15th come around, I'll be done sold some more. So my goal, my ultimate goal is to sell a thousand books at a thousand dollars, a thousand times a thousand equal a million, right. which make me a legitimate millionaire, proven to the world, proven to myself first, but proven to the world that the hustle is transferable. And that's what it is. I'm going to do it. I can't be stopped. Uh, being on this show is going to help me because the real guy is going to kick in and see the realness, peep the authenticity, peep my pedigree. Ain't gonna want to support a real guy doing something real. And then once you get a real guy in play, then we can reach for our own. You know, you get with the likes of your kind. Because when a sucker on the scene, a player don't stand a chance. Mm. And the book is actually on your shirt right now. There it is. It's a dirty game. 
It's Memoirs a dirty game. Of a Memoirs Keith, of a Hustler, man. K.P. Presley. Man, get at me. K.P. The Man 1000 IG. K.P. The Man dot com where you could buy the book or DM me. That's what's happening. Man, I appreciate the plug, man. Absolutely. Well, listen, K.P., I appreciate you coming in and uh, telling your story. Uh, a lot of people in your position, I think, would have just cooperated and walked away and Went to go live somewhere out of the way and maybe change their identity, go into the witness protection. I couldn't do it, man. I, I Listen, I could not do it. That's It's not in me. And for those who do, that's on you. I'm not I'm not here to down anybody that choose that path. I'm here to represent the real dudes, man, the real stand-up cats. If you ain't never seen a stand-up dude before, you're looking at him right here on this television show, I mean, on this podcast. You're looking at a real dude. So I read the contract before I signed it. And uh, I'm glad I stood. And for those who folded, that's on them. They got to live with themselves. Well, right now, there is a, there's a kid in Chicago, a teenager, that's going to be watching this and saying, well, I'm going to be the next KP, but I'm not going to make all the mistakes he made, and I'm never going to go to prison, and I'm going to be a billionaire off this shit. What would you tell that kid? I would tell him that the drug game is designed for you to lose. It's fixed. It's fixed from the standpoint that you have to buy the drugs from somebody and you have to sell it to someone. So that means it's two against one already. Mm. We ain't got to the part where this person sell it to that person, that person, that person. So it's designed for you to lose. And in this day and age, you know, they tell before they stand. The telling team is bigger than the hustle team. Remember that. The telling team is bigger than the hustle team. So get in, get out, and move around, man. I'm showing that you can become a millionaire selling books. Find you a niche and hit it. Well, yeah. And on top of that, and I've always looked at this myself, is that when it comes to legal activity, the more effort you put into it and the bigger it becomes, it just means there's a bigger bigger penalty at the end of it. So you're hustling towards your demise. So isn't it just better to hustle in a legal profession where the bigger you get, you, you could actually stay there and, and continue to grow as opposed to, you know, have a a huge crash at the end because most guys I've interviewed, it's usually the same story. I balled out for five years and got 15 years. I balled out for four years and got 20 years. It's always a ratio for every year you're living the life and got the girls and the cars and the money. There's usually three, four, five years in prison that you pay for all that balling, which to me is just not worth it. Uh, I would agree with you from the standpoint of where you're looking at it from. But when you have no other option that you think you have no other options, uh, then that's uh, something that the risk is worth the reward. Uh, and you're right. The story is the same. It, 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 that's why I didn't write the book 20 years ago because everybody wanted the story because they knew I made millions of dollars and dated celebrities and rode private jets and all that stuff. But I'm sitting in jail with 42 years. The story was a losing story. So now that I have 25 years later, I have a winning story. That's why I'm coming out from behind the walls and letting everybody know, yeah, I was a kingpin, but look at me now. I am an international, I throw international boxing matches all over the world, bigger than life entertainment. Uh, and I make money off of that. I make money selling books. And these are just showing that the hustle is transferable, man, because anytime you're just negotiating with people. Uh, a lot of people don't have the confidence that I have in their ability. They just feel like they're stuck in that world. So I agree with you that it's not worth it because you're going to go to jail, you're going to get killed. Like, And I was one of the smartest ones and one of the most successful ones, and it happened to me. I never got caught on my own, but somebody threw me under the bus. And that's why I said this, the fight is fixed. That's what it is. KP, appreciate you coming in. Looking forward to reading your book. Man, look here, man. I want you to do something real famous, man. I want you to purchase this book for me, man, because I promise you, I promise you, on everything I stand for, man, that it would enlighten you. All right. That's what it is then. That's what it is. Till next time. Man, my man. Peace.